Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip Emigwali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, New St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind address the theme crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, New St. Augustine. Thank you. I'm Philippe Magwale. I'm often asked, how are supercomputers used? To be specific, how could large-scale computational physicists have used the world's fastest computer to save the half a million lives that were lost during the 1970 Bola cyclone of Bangladesh? We are vulnerable to the uncontrollable forces of nature. We can't shield ourselves from nature's destructive effects, but we can forecast the occurrences of storm surges, typhoons, and hurricanes. In my fastest computing lecture of about September 24, 1985, I also explained how to parallel process storm surges, typhoons, and hurricanes, and how to simulate such phenomena at the highest parallel processed supercomputer resolutions, and do so to forecast the dangerous rise in water levels that will occur during tropical cyclones and occur when strong winds push water onto coastal communities. On November 3, 1970, and in Pakistan, and in East Pakistan, now renamed Bangladesh, and in India, and in India's West Bengal, half a million people died during the Bola cyclone. That tropical cyclone produced a 33 feet high storm surge. The fastest computers are used to foresee earthquakes typhoons, tsunamis, and flooding arising from sudden torrential rainfalls. Typhoon Nina appeared on July 30, 1975. The flooding triggered by the collapse of the Banque Reservoir Dam in China caused the collapse of smaller downstream dams. 229,000 people died during Typhoon Nina. In 1979, and at the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C., I conducted physics research on how to use the fastest computers to forecast the wave heights and speeds of propagated flood waves that arise from dam bricks. An example is the flood wave from the collapse of the Banque Reservoir Dam of China. After my discovery of the fastest computing across an ensemble of a billion coupled processors. China used my new knowledge to develop a supercomputer powered by 10.65 million off-the-shelf processors and ranked as the world's fastest. The new supercomputer could be used to handcast or reforecast Typhoon Nina and used to handcast the collapse of the Banque Reservoir Dam of China. Such supercomputer models are used to determine when to evacuate residents that live within the floodplain that's downstream of the Banque Reservoir Dam of China. If Chinese residents of the floodplain downstream of the Banque Reservoir Dam were evacuated on July 30, 1975, some of the 229,000 lives lost could have been saved. My scientific discovery, which occurred on July 4, 1989, was this. The slowest processors in the world could be harnessed and used to solve the most compute-intensive problems in the world and solve them 
at the fastest possible speeds in the world. That discovery is the major achievement of my scientific career. That discovery made me the subject of school essays on computer inventors and their inventions. My contribution to computer science is the reason I'm listed on the same top 10 list with Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and Albert Einstein. I discovered that parallel supercomputing is a tool that can reduce meteorological forecast errors, like the error that resulted in the shipwreck of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. That shipwreck occurred on November 10, 1975. I remember where I was when the SS Edmund Fitzgerald shipwrecked. I was living at 2540 Southwest Whiteside Drive, Covalis, Oregon, which was the residence of Fred and Anne Merrifield. Fred Merrifield was a British fighter pilot who was shot down during the First World War. Fred Merrifield co-founded one of the largest engineering firms in the USA, named CH2M. That shipwreck was the subject of a 1976 hit ballad by Gordon Lightfoot. It was titled, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. In 1975, meteorological forecasts were executed on supercomputers powered by one processor and hence weren't as accurate as the high-resolution parallel processed forecast of today, powered by up to 10.65 million processors. In 1975, supercomputing as it's known today only existed as science fiction. And the fastest computers used by the U.S. National Weather Service weren't fast enough. Those supercomputers failed to solve the governing system of partial differential equations that we are used to predict the gale force winds, the steep wave heights, and the treacherous conditions across Lake Superior, which is the largest of the Great Lakes. Lake Superior had a surface area of 82,100 square kilometers, or 17 times the size of Anambra State of Nigeria. Lake Superior has a maximum depth of 1,332 feet, or 0.4 kilometers, which makes it 13 times deeper than the River Niger at Timbuktu, Mali. Lake Superior has a volume of 12,100 cubic kilometers. That's 5 million times the volume of the Great Pyramid of Giza that's ranked as one of the seven wonders of the world. Lake Superior can sustain water waves that are the heights of a four-story house. My lecture of about September 24, 1985 in Ann Arbor, Michigan, was on how to parallel process water movements, water temperature profiles, and ice dynamics, and do so within the Great Lakes of North America. The Great Lakes are five interconnected freshwater lakes that include Lake Superior, Huron, Michigan, Ontario, and Erie and that account for one-fifth of the fresh water on Earth. The Great Lakes span 750 miles, or 1,207 kilometers, and 95,160 square miles, or a little more than one quarter the size of Nigeria. The Great Lakes are on the U.S. and Canadian borders, and are dotted with 35,000 islands. When I began supercomputing in 1974, 
It was nearly impossible for a black computer scientist to be hired in a federal research laboratory. In the U.S., black geniuses were treated as trespassers in nearly all white scientific spaces. In the mid-1980s, I had job offers at the entrance scientific and engineering levels, but I rejected those jobs because I was grossly overqualified for each. Asking I, the sole programmer of 16 supercomputers, to become an ordinary computer scientist was like asking an acrobatic jet fight, fighter, fighter pilot that's broken world records to become an Okada motorcycle rider. Even though I was shamefully overqualified for the engineering position that I held in Casper, Wyoming, I was denied a promotion. Instead, a le far less qualified white male was offered the promotion that I was denied. At the same time, I was offered several promotions, but that was because those making the hiring decisions did not know that I was black and African. In my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985, in Ann Michigan, I theorized how to chop up the Great Lakes into 65,536 smaller lakes, each represented as an initial boundary value, mathematical problem that I must message pass and send and receive and do so with a one problem to one processor correspondence. My fastest computing theory was abstract and went over the heads of the research scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I wasn't hired. The forces that brought me from College Park, Maryland to Ann Arbor, Michigan began in July 1985. And when I received a telephone call from a research biologist who worked at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that lab was operated by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I received that telephone inquiry in my office within the Graymax building of the U.S. National Weather Service. The, what, the National Weather Service is an agency operated by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. In the early 1980s, the most brilliant black mathematicians weren't employed to conduct scientific research in U.S. government laboratories. In the U.S. of the early 1980s, the most brilliant mathematicians of sub-Saharan African descent weren't welcome to teach students of European descent and do so in any of its 5,000 institutions of higher learning. I invented new mathematics that made the news headlines, discovered new physics that opened the door to large-scale computational fluid dynamics, and discovered new computer science that earned me what computer scientists referred to as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize of supercomputing for 1989. But yet, I couldn't teach the world's fastest computing to a classroom of young Americans. In 1985, and in Ann Arbor, Michigan, it was preferable to hire an obscure white person to teach the slowest computing than to hire a famous black supercomputer scientist to teach the world's fastest computing. The 1,000 podcasts and closed captioned videos that I posted on YouTube represent what I could have taught in American classrooms. In the 1970s and 80s, the decades I came of age, I couldn't name one black scientist then teaching mathematics or physics or computer science at any predominantly white institutions in the USA. For those reasons, research scientists 
who attended my higher lecture of about September 24, 1985, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We are shocked when they discovered that I was black and sub-Saharan African. I was the foremost supercomputer scientist they could invite to Ann Arbor, Michigan. My 1985 lecture that took place at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, Ann Arbor, Michigan, was on how I will, for the first time in the history of computer science, send and receive portions of my lake circulation models and do so via emails <clears throat> to my 16-bit long addresses of my two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand initial boundary value problems and how to send them to and from 65,536 of the shelf processors and standard parts. Once again, the new knowledge of how I executed the fastest computer speed on Earth and did so while solving the most compute-intensive problems and did so across the slowest processors was not in computer science textbooks of the 1980s. In the 1980s, parallel supercomputing existed only in the realm of science fiction. And my quest was to figure out how to turn that science fiction into non-fiction. The research scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan and elsewhere didn't understand my lecture on the world's fastest computing. But at a visceral level, they understood that I had a flawless command of materials and that I was at the frontiers of scientific and technological knowledge and at the crossroad where new mathematics, new physics and the world's fastest computing intersected. After my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985, some research scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan and elsewhere sensed that fastest computing across 1 billion processors instead of computing within one processor will be paradigm shifting and should change the way we look at both the computer and the supercomputer. During a White House speech that was delivered on August 26, 2000, then US President Bill Clinton referred to the Philip M. Aguale formula. My formula enables the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. I possessed my unmistakably unique supercomputing vision, namely solving the most difficult problems across the Philip M. Aguale internet that's a new global network of up to a billion equidistant processors that shared nothing. My theorized vision was to harness a new internet that was a new global network of the slowest two raised to power 16 processors in the world. I visualized my 64 binary thousand processors as braided together and as uniformly distributed around a hypersphere that I also visualized as embedded within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. I visualized my 65,536 processors as braided together by 16 times to raise to power 16 short and regular email wires. My research goal was to use my new internet to discover the fastest speed in supercomputing and to invent the first supercomputer as it's known today from the bowels of a vast ensemble of the slowest processors in the world. My supercomputer quest that began on June 20, 1974 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA and ended on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, 
was to find the extraordinary among the ordinary and do so by emulating the fastest processor in the world that I emulated by integrating the slowest processors in the world and integrating them to invent one seamless, coherent supercomputer that's not a new computer by or in itself, but that's a new internet in reality. In 1989, I was in the news for providing the quote-unquote final proof that parallel supercomputing is not science fiction. I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. The computer that performed automatic computations and did so within itself was invented in the 1940s. That computer invention heralded a paradigm shift or a change in the way we compute. The new way we compute paradigm shifted from mechanical to, electro to electronic and automatic. My quest for how to solve the most compute intensive problems in supercomputing and solve them with the fastest computations across the slowest processors in the world began in the 1970s and 80s. I was in the news because I discovered the first fastest computing that's powered by the slowest processing. That's the first supercomputing as it's executed today. The world's fastest computers have multiple industrial applications that can be indirectly measured by its $45 billion a year sales. How can the supercomputer powered by 1 billion processors benefit you? The world's fastest computer that's powered by the world's slowest processors that shared nothing was the first search engine. That supercomputer provided answers to natural language queries and did so before the internet. The supercomputer that's powered by one million processors will enable us to predict coastal storm surges and do so more accurately, faster, better, and less expensively. A coastal storm surge is a tsunami-like phenomenon that can arise from low-pressure weather systems. A coastal storm surge is rising water that can reach as high as 20 feet and extend miles inland. Large-scale computational hydrodynamics is the supercomputing tool used to forecast coastal storm surges. Extreme-scale computational fluid dynamics includes the simulation of the spread of highly contagious COVID-19 viruses that emerge during a once-in-a-century global pandemic. The world's fastest computer is used to understand the required social distancing that must be enforced inside London's metro and inside American subway systems that pack passengers like sardines. I came, I came to the largest conference of mathematicians to deliver an invited lecture on my contributions to mathematics. I delivered that lecture at the International Congress of Mathematicians called ICM 91. That mathematics conference is the Olympics for mathematicians who invented new mathematics. My lecture on the nine Philip M. Aguale partial differential equations was delivered on Monday, July 8, 1991 in Washington, D.C. At that International Congress of Mathematicians, I kept a tally of the black mathematicians that I saw. I counted two. 
myself included, out of thousands of mathematicians. As a prominent research computational mathematician, I found an album of Michigan to be a bastion of white supremacists. The irony is that I alone has more podcast lectures and YouTube videos than the 1,000 scientists and engineers in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Across my 1,000 YouTube lectures on supercomputing, it was acknowledged that I was second to none. But in Ann Arbor, Michigan, only white candidates that could not deliver a solid hiring lecture were hired to program or teach supercomputing. Since 1985, some wondered why I experienced such deeply institutionalized racism in Ann Arbor, Michigan of the 1980s. It began with my lecture on fastest computing delivered on about September 24, 1985. From that lecture, some physicists in Ann Arbor, Michigan identified me as a mathematician to watch. For four years onward of 1985, it was in the air in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that Philip M. Aguale could record a breakthrough in fastest computing and become famous. For those reasons, when I returned to my research base in College Park, Maryland, from late September 1985 to late April 1986, and to Casper, Wyoming, from late April 1986, to April 1987, those research physicists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, courted me to return to Michigan. I was begged to resign from my job with the U.S. government and to relocate from Casper, Wyoming, to Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was not invited to Ann Arbor, Michigan, because I was good looking. I came to Ann Arbor on about September 23, 1985, because my reputation as the supercomputer scientist that knew the most about fastest computers preceded me. I'm the only scientist from Ann Arbor, Michigan, that's the subject of school essays on inventors. Both the governor of Michigan and the Michigan House of Representatives issued a special proclamation in which they thanked me for my contributions to computer science and to Michigan. Yet, on about September 24, 1985, I wasn't hired to conduct the same supercomputer research that was publicly praised by both the governor of Michigan and the president of the United States. The reason I wasn't hired on about September 24, 1985 can be better understood from the context of the white backlash from the race riots that preceded my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The reason was that I gave my hiring lecture on fastest computing across the slowest processors and gave it only 17 years after the nearby five-day Detroit riot of July 23, 1967. The Detroit riot of Michigan was one of the deadliest riots in the, in the USA. The Detroit riot left 43 persons dead. The aftermath and consequences of that Detroit riot were that the white scientific community in the affluent suburb of Detroit, including Ann Arbor, Michigan, enforced an unwritten policy of not hiring any black mathematician or computer scientist, especially those that gave the most outstanding hiring lectures that are now posted as podcasts and YouTube videos. After my hiring lecture, the supercomputer research position that brought me to Ann Arbor, Michigan was cancelled and re-advertised. 
the unqualified white candidate hired is forgotten while the qualified black candidate that wasn't hired became the subject of school essays for his contributions to computer science. In Michigan, I played tennis as an antidote to solving difficult problems. I was most productive when I'm physically fit. In 1989 and 90, I was in local newspapers both for reaching the finals of a citywide white tennis tournament and for winning the highest award in supercomputing. The July 22, 1989 issue of the Anabo News carried an article on my reaching the finals of the Anabo City Tennis Tournament. 18 days earlier, or at the beginning of the tennis tournament, I had discovered the world's fastest computing as it's known today. Even though I was one of the most knowledgeable supercomputer scientists that ever lived, I wasn't hired for any of the 25,000 supercomputing positions in the US. In the 1970s and 80s, it was an unwritten policy not to hire Nigerians or Black Sub-Saharan Africans in the USA in high paying engineering positions. For those reasons, over half of the taxi drivers in major metropolitan areas were highly educated immigrants, including Black Sub-Saharan Africans who were trained as engineers and scientists. In the US of the 1970s and 80s, I was only hired via telephone interviews. The reason was that I came across as very knowledgeable and I exhibited the command of materials that can be seen in my 1000 podcasts and YouTube videos. And they couldn't overcome their racial stereotype and imagine that I was a black African. That was how I was offered several professional jobs, including the supercomputing position that I was offered but declined in late 1986 at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Aberdeen, Maryland. My supercomputing job hiring lectures of the early 1980s were the precursors to the lectures that I posted on my YouTube channel named Emma Aguale. By 1985, research mathematicians who attended my supercomputing lectures declared that I was the only supercomputer scientist in the world that could work alone to harness the slowest processors in the world and use those processors to solve the most compute intensive problems in the world and solve those problems at the fastest speeds in the world and execute those three things when those supercomputer experiments were considered impossible. I first came to Anabo, Michigan on about September 24, 1985. I was invited to give a job hiring lecture on supercomputing. During the first half of the 1980s, I conducted supercomputing research in College Park, Maryland. My focus was on large-scale computational mathematics and its applications to the fluid dynamics of physics. At noon and on weekdays, I'll take a shuttle bus for the 25-minute ride from Silver Spring Metro Station to College Park, Maryland. In College Park, I spent significant time in the coffee room for research mathematicians only. That coffee room was at 4176 Campus Drive. Half of the time, I was inside the nearby research library that has specialized collections in mathematics, physics, and computer science. Or I might be attending a research seminar on new mathematics that's presented by, visiting, by the visiting mathematician that invented it. Those lectures inspired me to invent the nine Philip M. Aguale equations. 
I spent my day and night in College Park, Maryland and Silver Spring, Maryland, respectively. And I was conducting research in the then unknown world of the hoped for world's fastest computing across the world's lowest processors. In 1985, that new technology that will later, or after my discovery of July 4, 1989, be at the granite core of the world's fastest computers, was then in the realm of science fiction and had not entered into computer science textbooks. My grand challenge was to be the first person to understand how to turn that fiction to non-fiction or how to turn parallel computing that was then the slowest computing to the fastest computing. To turn that fiction to non-fiction and do so for the most large-scale computational fluid dynamics codes that must be executed across high-resolution supercomputer models of a physical domain or across an oil field that's up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers below the surface of the Earth and up to twice the size of the state of Anambra, Nigeria. The solutions to such grand challenge problems demanded that I discover new partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus and that I invent new companion partial difference equations of large-scale computational linear algebra, as well as pioneer a new computer science that must be central to manufacturing the fastest computers ever. To invent the first supercomputer as it's known today is to create a new computer science that new computer science didn't reside within a new computer. That new computer science was defined across processors that outlined the new massively parallel supercomputer hopeful. At the granite core of my new computer science was my message passing of my initial boundary value problems. Am I sending and receiving them in a one problem to one processor corresponding manner? And my communicating them across my 64 binary thousand off the shelf processors that outlined my new internet. On about September 24, 1985, supercomputing across millions of processors was still in the realm of science fiction. So my research lectures of the early 1980s on supercomputing computing across millions of processors were science fiction, not science. Not long ago, and in Leeds, England, the BBC reported that a mathematician, Joe Atkinson, murdered his girlfriend. The mother was fueled by jealousy. The girlfriend, Poppy David Waterhouse, was a prodigiously gifted mathematician. The personal attacks that I received from jealous mathematicians and physicists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, only occurred because I was only 35 years old, but favorably compared to Albert Einstein and had, and had alone won what they referred to as the Nobel Prize of Supercomputing for 1989. I am the only prominent scientist since Albert Einstein who never co-authored with another scientist. After my supercomputing lecture of about September 24, 1985, that took place at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan, of NOAA. My lecture was positively discussed by Ann Arbor scientists who worked outside that NOAA laboratory. NOAA is the acronym 
for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The supercomputing lecture that I delivered in, an, in Ann Arbor, Michigan on about September 24, 1985 is like the lectures I posted as 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos. In scientific research, the videotaped lecture is used to establish the credibility and to estimate the IQs of the most prominent mathematicians of the last half century. The intellect or knowledge or level of education of any modern mathematician is almost exclusively judged by his or her videotaped lectures as seen on YouTube. When what they saw differs from what they had, people believe what they saw over what they had. To do otherwise is called confirmation bias. The reality that a black African-born supercomputer scientist was making the new satellites for discovering that the fastest computers could be manufactured from the slowest processors and for discovering how to solve the most compute-intensive problems was too much for the psychological well-being of some scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Their confirmation bias was the reason they discounted that I was in the news for my discovery that the technology of parallel processing can power the world's fastest computing. Their confirmation bias was the reason they rejected a new technology that was an alternative way of solving the most compute-intensive problems in mathematics, physics, and computer science. Their confirmation bias made them to discount that I alone won the highest award in supercomputing. That prize is normally won by a diverse, talented, multi-institutional and interdisciplinary research team of up to 50 research scientists that are often supported by 1,000 persons. This year, the highest award in supercomputing was shared by 28 co-winners. During my conversations on fastest computing in 1989, scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, stared at me with a blank look on their faces. They fell into a trance because I was black and sub-Saharan African, and because my command of materials widely exceeded theirs, and because my material was over their heads. Again, I've posted a thousand videos on YouTube, each describing my contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science. YouTube has 8 billion videos, including award lectures. Any person who made a paradigm-shifting contribution to knowledge is recognized with the highest awards or the equivalents of the Nobel Prize for their discipline. An award lecture posted on YouTube is the precondition to winning the highest scientific awards. In 1989, I won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in supercomputing. As a prize winner, I was obliged to share my contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science and share them across a thousand podcasts and YouTube videos. On about September 24, 1985, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, what spread that through the grapevine that a 31 year old black supercomputer scientist gave a lecture on the newly emerging field of massively parallel computing and on how to use that never before seen technology to solve the most compute intensive problems in computational fluid dynamics. In 1985, supercomputing as it's known today was still in the realm of science fiction. At that time, parallel processing was looked at with, at with tremendous awe as the next big thing 
and as the holy grail of supercomputing. As a supercomputer researcher who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, my supreme quest was to turn that science fiction to non-fiction. From their mathematical intuition, a few leading mathematicians that were mostly in College Park, Maryland, and Ann Arbor, Michigan, speculated that Philip M. Aguale could discover how to solve the most compute-intensive problems and solve them across an ensemble of the slowest processors in the world and solve them at the fastest possible speeds ever recorded. Their speculation became true at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. So my world's fastest computer invention that made the news in 1989 was in the air in Maryland, Michigan, and New Mexico. My discovery revolutionized both the computer and the supercomputer the most powerful supercomputers I used to solve the most compute-intensive problems in mathematics, science, and engineering. Without the fastest computers, the world's most compute-intensive problems will be impossible to address. The fastest computer is why you know the weather before going outside. Thank you. I'm Philip Bernardo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Insightful and brilliant lecture.